Good afternoon and welcome to the HRSA SPENS initiative, Improving HIV Health Outcomes Through the Coordination of Supportive Employment and Housing Services. Today's initiative's objectives are to describe the complex needs of people with HIV who experience homelessness, housing instability, and unemployment and underemployment, to develop strategies to build staff skills and create external partnerships and to facilitate care and services. We will share strategies, resources, and tools to provide integrative care to people with HIV who are out of care, who are homeless and unstably housed, and unemployed and underemployed. And we will also describe opportunities to leverage partnerships with federally funded housing, and unemployment, and other community agencies to serve people with HIV who are homeless, unstably housed, and unemployed and underemployed. I am your moderator, Corliss D. Heath. I, I am a health scientist in the Division of Policy and Data here at the HIV AIDS Bureau, Health Resources and Services Administrative at HRSA at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. On our panel today, our presenters are Serena Rajabrian, who serves as the co-principal investigator for the Homeless and Employment Initiative and also the co-investigator for the Evaluation and Technical Assistance Provider, the ETAP, for the project. We also have Joe Ramirez for CA, who was the pre principal investigator for the Positive Resource Center in San Francisco, California. We have Cynthia Tucker, the principal investigator for AIDS Foundation of Chicago in Chicago, Illinois. And we also have Nancy Vasquez, the interventionist for Bear County Hospital District at the University Health Center in San Antonio, Texas. I will now turn it over to Serena Rajavian. Before we go any further, just one disclosure, the authors here on our panel today have no relevant financial or non-financial interest to disclose. Now I'll turn it over to Serena. Thanks, Corliss, for noting my, that we have nothing to disclose. That's great. Um, so we're so pleased to be here today to talk with you about this exciting initiative that HRSA has put together for the last few years on not only um, improving housing and employment to increase, not only improving housing, but also employment to improve um, HIV um, health outcomes. So today, um, myself, along with my three distinguished colleagues across the demonstration sites are going to kick off a, a series of workshops. We have three. This is the first one um, about addressing barriers to care for people who are experiencing homelessness and on an un or underemployment. So um, our objectives today with this session one workshop are uh, the, our panelists, we're going to describe the needs of people with HIV who are experiencing homelessness or unstable housing, and the unique challenges that they face in terms of achieving retention and care and viral suppression. So we're gonna talk about some of the social determinants that affect the HIV care outcomes, housing, but also employment, which is an important piece, as well as some other social needs that they may have as well. And we hope by the end of this session, you learn some strategies to address those challenges within specific populations, both at the individual patient level, providers, as well as the system level. So first of all, let me give you a little bit of background about our initiative. Um, and, and many of you are probably finding this as Ryan White organizations working with clients that not only um, are struggling with living with HIV, staying engaged in care and um, adhering to treatment, but they also have other needs, not just medical, that are important. Some may be experiencing unstable housing, some may need food, some um, may feel healthy enough and they wanna work but can't find a, a job. And all of these really impact whether someone can stay in care and it requires 
a, a coordinated effort across all these different sectors, housing, employment, food, and other social needs. They're all interdependent on each other, and we've come to see that more and more. Many of you know, um, and you might hear from other workshops in this conference, um, conference that even among Ryan White clients, those clients who have unstable housing are more likely to be virally detectable compared to their st stable housing partners who are more likely to be virally suppressed or retained in care. So really addressing the needs of this population are critical and helping them find housing can be challenging. Why? Because one, they may not earn enough income um, to be able to afford where they're living in their community. And that's really difficult, especially if somebody doesn't have employment. And vice versa, employment can be challenging if someone doesn't have a stable place to live, to, to go home and rest every night or to store their medications. So be feeling in a safe, quality, affordable place to live um, also helps someone stay employed. So the, this reason, this initiative wanted to look at the challenges with both lack of housing stability as well as employment, how that impacts HIV care outcomes and what can be some of the strategies and we're gonna learn that from our panelists today. So it's really critical that we address both these social determinants. So where we are right now in the initiative, we're in year three of a three year project cycle. This again is supported through the Department of Health and Human Services, the Secretary's Minority AIDS Initiative and uh, the HIV AIDS Bureau Special Projects of National Significance Program. Um, our 12 demonstration sites the main goal of this initiative is to improve health outcomes for low income, uninsured, underinsured people with HIV who are from predominantly racial ethnic minority communities by coordinating their health, housing, and employment systems that are addressing the, the social determinants of health and reduce disparities such as poverty and homelessness. Uh, in addition to the 12 sites, um, I myself are from the evaluation and technical assistance provider, as Corliss mentioned, and our task in this is to work with the sites to correct, uh, conduct uh, evaluation of their interventions, coordinate and provide technical assistance to the demonstrations, either around housing, employment, or other areas. Um, and also lead and coordinate the efforts around publishing the findings from the evaluation, the products, and disseminate those activities such as this conference workshop about what are some of the lessons learned from implementing housing and employment interventions. So this map shows you where the 12 sites are located. These gray boxes are the 12 intervention sites. You can see that they're spread across the country from the West Coast to um, the middle of the country to the East Coast and down in the South in Texas and Georgia. And then the uh, yellow boxes here are part of the evaluation and technical assistance team. Uh, so just a little bit about the organizational settings. We have um, four sites who are funded. Um, they are either city or county um, dis health departments or district health departments. Uh, today, we're gonna hear from Bear County Hospital District. Uh, we also have four Ryan White AIDS funded comprehensive um, health programs and or federally qualified health centers um, and they're listed here. And then we also have four AIDS service organizations and we're going to hear from uh, two, oh, sorry about that, there are actually five. Um, we're going to hear from two of them today, AIDS Foundation of Chicago and Positive Resource Center in San Francisco. And then um, in partnership with Liberty Community Services, we also have Yale University AIDS program, which is a comprehensive Ryan White program that provides medical care and behavioral health. But all these settings are implementing housing, employment interventions, as well as connecting people to HIV primary medical care. And then the types of interventions that they're implementing. This slide here describes the types of interventions across all 12 sites. They have some form of staff member who's some staff member who's providing navigation or care coordination. Uh, they may be called a community health worker, and we're going to hear from one today or member advocate. Uh, some may be called um, 
uh, employment specialists or care coordination specialists, but they're all helping to organize services and connect clients to both housing, employment, and healthcare and other service needs. Three sites are implementing system-wide case management training where they're training HIV medical case managers about the importance of housing employment needs and some strategies. Three are um, training their own HIV medical case managers about these needs and doing assessments and screening around those um, interventions, uh, around those needs. Three organizations are working on streamlining referrals. In other words, uh, organ helping to organize the way the referral system between housing, between healthcare, and between employment or case management may be working. We have two sites that are actively engaged with their um, HAPWA um, partner and um, to get housing for their clients. And, th and that means that they have an actual subcontract, but all the sites in some way, shape, or form are working with housing related providers in their areas. And we'll, we'll hear about some of that today. And then two are actually working on improving and expanding their uh, technology capacity, their data management systems to do better sharing of housing and healthcare data across their site to help streamline referrals, for example, um, across the different um, sectors. So a little bit about of what we're doing in the evaluation and our approach um, of why we're undertaking this initiative and how we're going about evaluating it. We're using what's called engaging consumers in health and healthcare in their communities framework. Um, so what we're looking at are strategies and we wanna know the impact of what are the strategies, these models that each of these sites are doing to help activate the client to get them ready to work, ready to be housed, how do we gather that information for the client, help them make decisions about whether to, how to, how to engage in employment and in housing, how to engage in healthcare seeking behavior? When are they ready for that? And we'll hear some strategies from the sites today. We also look at some of the, what we call the group characteristics. So what is it about the organizational setting, the community setting? What are some of the external factors that are affecting whether a client can actually obtain housing and employment? What are some of those barriers that need to be addressed and how are these interventions doing that? So to, in the course of our initiative, um, we're in the process of, we've been gathering data for the last uh, couple of years. Our data will close at the end of this month, but this here shows you some of the questions that um, we're uh, um, gonna be answering um, through our initiative. And um, you'll hear some of these strategies today from our panelists, but we're gonna be looking at what strategies really expand employment opportunities for people who are experiencing unstable housing. What is that level of engagement? How intense? What do you need to do to get somebody employed? What does it cost? What, what are the barriers and facilitators for this proposed model that people are implementing at their site? What works well? And then how are these models being integrated into their agency, both their internal agency and how do they work with other external partners? So those are the, some of the process questions we're hoping to answer. And then in terms of outcomes, what we'll be looking at is really if we, these questions here, if we're able to, um, do we increase the number of people who get connected into um, employment opportunities into housing? Once they're employed or they're housed, do they become virally suppressed? Are they engaged in primary care? Are there any differences in outcomes between people who are unstably housed or stably housed? Between those who get employment and those who are not able to achieve employment? And then what factors are associated with improving employment over time? So those are the questions. We're not gonna answer all of those today. We're gonna to be looking more at the process and some of the barrier questions. Um, but stay tuned for the future because that will be coming up in the next year. So let me, before I turn over to our pan panelists, just talk a little bit about what our po patient population looks like, the clients that we're serving. So first of all, the, the clients that each one of these 12 sites are recruiting are um, what, very vulnerable. 
they're adults. We're, we're working with people who are living with HIV who are over the age of 18 years. And they have to meet one of these criteria. They're either newly diagnosed or they haven't been engaged in HIV primary care for about six months. They may be risk, at risk of falling out of care. They may have missed a few appointments. Uh, they may have other social factors such as substance use or mental health that makes it challenging for them to stay engaged in care. Or they may not be virally suppressed. In addition, they must be either homeless or unstably housed, and we are using the definitions that HUD talks about in terms of um, unstable housing or at risk for homelessness, um, that they may, uh, may, they may be, for example, literally homeless on the street or living in a public area or a shelter. They may be in a temporary um, place, not their own, where they don't have a lease in their name. They may be in a transitional temporary housing situation, maybe for a year or so. Or they may be living with friends and family that may appear to be stable, but they could be fleeing a domestic violence or they could be at risk of falling or losing their housing because of eviction, for example. And then finally, the criteria is that they are either unemployed or underemployed, that they express that at baseline. So who are the people that we're serving? So far in our study, we've been able to enroll over a thousand participants. The site so far in the course, um, since this initiative started just about three years ago, they have served over 1200 people, but only a thousand we're following in a study. And a majority of those are male. And we have a small but significant proportion of transgendered persons in our population. Majority are um, Hispanic or black, and majority are also US born. We have about 18% who are foreign born. In terms of age, the average age is working age, about 40 years, but they range from anyone who's 18 years all the way up to 73 years old. In terms of risk factors, about half reported at baseline feeling very good about their health, and adherence to medical treat um, their medications, but if, um, over 40% said they're still struggling with their health or medication adherence. Uh, roughly two, th um, two out of three participants have a history of incarceration. Um, about 70% have mental health challenges such as depression and about half ex um, express some challenges with anxiety. And um, a fair number have moderate to high rates of substance use in the past three months at baseline. In terms of housing status, um, you can see here, vast majority, 86%, have reported ever being homeless at some point in their life. So even if they may be stably housed at this stage, we have uh, about 3%. Um, there's a history there that they were homeless at one point, making them vulnerable again. Um, and at baseline, about 43% were currently homeless and 43% were in an unstable housing situation. In terms of employment, 80%, um, 81% were not currently employed in um, either part or any sort of temporary employment at baseline. Um, we had about 20% who reported, I'm working, but I'm underemployed. I would like to do more. And um, we in, uh, asked them about their need for skills and um, training. And about two thirds said they would like to have training or vacational support for some sort of employment activity. We also at Baseline asked about um, employment barriers, what about going back to work? What was some of their, um, uh, what were some of their perceived barriers of what kept them from the workplace? And this graph shows that those who uh, reported barriers, about 40% felt they did, um, they felt healthy to work, um, but they, of that, about um, many expressed, one third expressed some sort of daily health changes that would make it challenging for them to work. Another third said, I worry about being able to take time off to see the doctor. Another third th thought they might not have the job skills to be employed. And finally, about a quarter of our population expressed they're concerned about HIV discrimination. 
even despite treatments and living with HIV, today in 2020, a fair proportion of our population still express concern about HIV discrimination in the workplace. So these are real challenges that we find um, in terms of motivating people and helping and giving them the support to go back to work. We also um, asked sites at the beginning about some of the barriers, what they found um, in terms of the structural or community barriers to getting, um, addressing housing and employment. And um, this quote here that you'll see, the main um, factor has to do with issues such as poverty, racism, mass incarceration, and, and employment opportunities. And that's what this initiative is, is really designed to do. So with that, what I'd like to do, I'm gonna turn it over to Joe Ramirez Forcier, who's going to start sharing their model and experience in working with transgender populations. Joe? Thanks, Serena. So, hello everybody, I'm Joe Ramirez Forcier from Positive Resource Center, now known as PRC, and we're located in downtown San Francisco. I wanna go over some of the history of uh, why is the transgender population concentrated in San Francisco? So we'll go to the next slide. And it really started um, in the 20s and 30s and 40s. So there has been a history in, a, in one of the central areas of San Francisco called, called the Tenderloin Quarter, a neighborhood where um, and due to military banning of participation for gays, lesbians, and non-gender conforming folks, they created a community as they were discharged in San Francisco and did not desire to go home. And they started forming communities. There was also a notable person, Virginia Prince, who started a transgender communication network. And so it became known as a central hub of communication in a way uh, to kind of communicate and find uh, kindred spirits uh, to form community. Um, also, uh, needless to say, there was a lot of discrimination during that time. Uh, one of the historical events that kind of galvanized the, the transgender community was the Compton Cafeteria Riot, not widely known, but there's some film and uh, a lot of stuff out there to read up upon. In August of 1996, uh, trans individuals were being harassed by the police and uh, they stood up and caused a brawl uh, which took on several days and started changing the laws in San Francisco. Um, but that happened three, well, three years before uh, Stonewall happened in New York City and people started learning they could stand up for their rights. Most notably are the statistics at the intersection of homelessness and being LGBTQ in San Francisco. So in 2019, the city and county of San Francisco conducted a point in time count um, of the homeless population on January 24th, 2019. And they also surveyed homeless individuals in order to profile their experiences and characteristics. And the results showed greater disproportion of those that have been most subjected to historical and societal impacts um, who were most likely to be homeless. So for homeless demographics in San Francisco, 37% um, uh, of the individuals were black, even though the population of San Francisco is 5.2% of San Francisco residents reporting being black in our census. So for 18% of the Latinx community that is homeless in San Francisco, they only com compromise 5.4% of the San Francisco residents as well. Um, and then another note is 27% of the LGBTQ clients, uh, individuals that are homeless and receiving services or uh, found in the census uh, which 4% of those transgender make a huge disproportion of the homeless population in San Francisco. 7% of those individuals had HIV and AIDS self-reported. Um, and um, the leading cause of homelessness they stated was due to um, a loss of a job. So one in four uh, reported that. 65% uh, reported being homeless for over a year and 45% say that it was their first episode of homelessness um, was at the age prior to 24 or younger, uh, kind of mirroring some of the, the statistics we're seeing of having uh, episodic homelessness in their past. Uh, notably, 17% of these individuals that are homeless in San Francisco are on SSI, SSDI, 
and 20% uh, received Medi-Cal, Medicare, which also shows a low engagement. Um, and 25%, one in four of the homeless individuals in San Francisco are justice involved. So that gives us some of the background of why we focused um, on this community. Next slide. So the barriers that individuals face in this intersectionality are uh, well known to us, racism, genderism. Um, there's a lot of gender fluidity in San Francisco. Um, there's a lot of uh, gender expression in transitioning that occur um, and have a lot of traumatic history and stories that they talk about uh, as we work with them. Um, also, it relates to housing, housing discrimination, housing access. We've all heard about agency, who helps you out when you need uh, help, right? Who accepts you, who rejects you? Um, and then employment. So this is a very um, slippery slope. Um, in San Francisco, in the LGBTQ population, when you're unable to obtain employment and you're unable to live uh, with benefits, you get, uh, you move into legal uh, areas uh, of work that are not advantageous to you, to say the least, and uh, they pay well. And so uh, whether that's sex work or uh, drug um, distribution and stuff like that, this gets you at the intersection of legal issues. Um, and it's hard to uh, transition off. Uh, for folks. Then there's the social issues, uh, acceptance of family and friends, um, and of course, access, even though in San Francisco we have access to care for all, we still find a high number of people who still do not have access to care. Next slide. So what we do is really intensive, warm, accompany support linkage to care in our model. Um, we do housing applications and connect people to stuff. And we'll talk about the forms we did on site at Positive Resource Center slash PRC. We have uh, attorneys and advocates that help people get general assistance. We have direct relationships with uh, to get uh, food access and state unemployment, SDI, SSI, reinstatement of benefits. We also have emergency financial assistance. And on site, we have one of the, the oldest a vocational rehabilitation programs that works with the Department of Rehabilitation. Um, so we work with, you know, um, close to 600 people a year just in the educational framework. And we have different modalities of care, but we, we really emphasize skills with computer training, lived experience of peer to peer to get people into direct service positions in the nonprofit sector, and of course, full time employment. Next slide. So how do we do it? Um, You've probably seen this model before, it's not new, but the most important part is your partner, right? Who do you choose to work with? So we chose for the homeless LGBT population, Larkin Street Services, a youth, youth services agency, and we found that um, uh, they have a lot of barriers. The reentry population, we partnered with Lutheran Social Services, and again, a lot of these people had just exited out of, uh, of you know, their legal situation. And then, um, PRC merged with a, an organization called Baker. And so we added uh, during the, the course of this, uh, a P PRC Baker residential treatment facility. Of course, uh, we uh, educated staff. We talked about the study, uh, the supports, the eligibility, and we really got the staff signed up and started uh, working with them on a weekly basis and then set up a process to do referrals and assessment. And we'll go a little bit further uh, on the next slide of how we used our case management model. So um, we really looked at acuity and, and basically uh, I, I think of this, what's primary for the person and in what order do they wanna work? Is it something they're self-managing and maybe an initial interaction, they don't want anyone to help them, but it's really good to know what's, what's off, off grid and on grid and all the things that people are managing. And then what are their moderate needs and what are their urgent needs? Um, it's really important to know how long, how long is your medication good for? Is your prescription expiring? So that, uh, you could assess that you're in care, but there could be a cliff of opportunity that really um, stops some of that engagement. So identifying that proactively is really important. And we focus on areas on, on access to care, health, um, your health status, medication adherence, mental health and substance use. Um, and then through the activity, Checklist is another way of intersectioning that and to develop a dialogue and a plan for someone. And we'll go a little that, but some of the areas we cover are the, the medical aspects, personal care, 
finance, legal, employment, housing, and anything else. Uh, there should always be other under all these categories because there's always something else. Next slide. So here's an example of someone, um, and this is a, just a, a name change. So, but a 53 year old trans woman who uh, had been homeless for over 10 years, um, struggling with substance use disorder as a case and uh, coping with mental health uh, symptoms. Um, and when they talked about their upcoming breast augmentation surgery, um, they needed housing. Um, so you, you all of a sudden in this intersection, they were, you know, people do have skills and abilities and resilience. And this person had done enough to be resilient, even though homeless, to work on something that was very important to them. Um, and what they needed is a, a post-op surgery place to recover. And so, um, and, uh, and what we did is we didn't really interfere with the health plan or the doctor's point of view of what this person needed. Um, and so what we did is we supported with the plan they had in place. And we really worked with them to get housing, temporary housing, to ensure that they had a place to stay. Um, and, uh, and we were able to do that. And we worked with um, one of our uh, hospital facilities that used to do end of life care that was now doing longer term care um, and medicalized care of people who needed. Um, uh, so working with current providers and trying to find the gray area in the housing market is in a very important problem solving technique that's really needed. Um, and the person is, is doing much, is doing well. Um, so that's good news. Uh, next slide. So what happened is um, Rebecca came in and we created a service plan and really wanted to address uh, long-term homelessness. But of course, what was on the table, which often is the case, is something that needed to be in the right now, near term. And we really needed the capacity of, of the, we had um, uh, house, a dedicated housing staff that you couldn't have done in an integrated model. You really need to have capacity within two to three days of work to do this intensive deep work. And then to secure for post-surgery uh, medical recovery, uh, a bed in some place. And then eventually to also reserve a shelter bed. So you can imagine um, on top of everything else, just the, the in, um, how, how can one do this and, and be homeless and to have someone who knows access in the system to do it in a timely way to meet the surgery that was impending. Um, and the good news is this person actually, um, and as we do see in our population in San Francisco, a lot of them do have a bachelor's degree or above, and this individual has a master's in social work and really wants to return in the social work field. And so regardless of the impediments that this person's facing, um, they still need supportive services, but there, there's so much upside to this person's potential and economic prosperity uh, for their well-being as well. Next slide. So, you know, I have a lot of opinions on this, but, uh, you know, integrating into existing services, and I want to say everywhere, supportive services, and we even found by working with the General Hospital uh, HIV Ward 86 that even cell phones are something you have to dig in on, because if you don't have a cell phone, you can't get care, you can't get that call for housing, you can't call for a shelter bed. So you, it, it's not it, not one home. It's in air. It needs to be in every home. And as we plan for everyone to live uh, with HIV and survive, we need to a plan a plan. I believe for their vocational and economic prosperity, so they don't have to have if they choose to to live in poverty. I just think we need to design a system with poverty not as the standard of care. Um, so that's my personal opinion. Uh, new funding, uh, it's just not well-funded. No, we're, uh, we're the lo oldest, longest, biggest HIV service provider. We have to claw, scratch. Uh, no one sets money aside. The VOC rehab system doesn't set aside for HIV. Ryan White does not for employment and house, you know, uh, services in this exact uh, cluster. And, um, it, and it, we really don't have a standard of care that's nationwide that allows people a fair chance in every city and county across our nation. And then policies, so the, how are we gonna change this? So we can do, we're do, we've grown a lot, granted, and but it's not consistent. And it breaks my heart to see um, certain states just not have the resources they need to help folks. So uh, we need to work together to set better policy at the local and state level. And next up, we have Cynthia Tucker from the AIDS Foundation of Chicago. Thank you, Joe. Um, 
Good afternoon, everyone. Cynthia Tucker coming from the AIDS Foundation Chicago, downtown Chicago. And I'm going to present some information on the reentry population and what we did around promising practices for housing and employment. Next slide. So just a little bit of background, our project entitled the Safe and Sound Return Partnership. Um, one of the reasons why we chose reentry as a population, one, because it's the eighth highest um, offender population in our area. We have over 215,000 men, women um, over the age of 18, and that includes the transgender population. Um, a present about 1.6% of Illinois prisons um, are HIV positive and about 0.5% um, of persons in Cook County Jail. Uh, there is a jail uh, overall of about 8,000 individuals um, and now due to COVID-19 has gone down. We are one of the states that really decreased our jail um, population and it's just a little over 5,000 currently. Uh, they have a huge amount of economic barriers, uh, high rates of mental health, a lot of trauma, um, substance use, and mental health, as well as dual stigma of being HIV positive, being from reentry, and also having mental health and substance use uh, disorders. And again, not being able to work with their family uh, for reunification and social support. Next slide. So what did we do? So part of what we wanted to do was really put together a task force that worked across different levels and had an influence on different impacts from that the individual was experienced once they are released. So we wanted to pull together a multi-level, multi-discipline task force that included individuals not only from employment and housing, but mental health, legal services, uh, social support. We wanted to have everyone as a part of this task force because we knew we would not be able to work long. Uh, we wanted to have housing navigation services, work readiness, and on top of work readiness, we think it's really vital and crucial and important that we had jobs and we were able to secure some of those. So we wanted some employers at the table and a part of the task force. Um, we wanted to have retention support, making sure that individuals were able to be re retained within medical care services, as well as we worked with them to get them employed and housed. And we used our existing existing uh, corrections case management program, which is an intensive case management program that has been working across Illinois for about 15 years. Next slide, please. So our activities included, really it's um, SSRP is a four pronged process where we worked directly with the individual. We worked um, with that relationship and making sure that we worked with providers to make sure that they were trained. Uh, we worked directly with community that was beyond. So making sure that we're working not only with that individual who is from the reentry population, but also those that work directly with the individual to get them trained. And we worked with at a societal level and we did some type of policy work. It was very um, crucial to the project. And so we wanted to make sure that we had a peer re-engagement specialist that was able to work directly with that individual. We in part partnered with several organizations that I'm gonna talk about throughout um, National Alliance and SOB is to work with that individual and to provide those services. And we created a, connect a Women's Connection Summit of Hope modeled after the Summit of Hope in the ability to reach the community on a more broader level. Next slide. So what we did, we addressed gaps and we built capacity for reentry services by providing trainings. Most of our trainings uh, 
really focused on trauma. And one of the reasons why we started to do that was we noticed that all of the individuals that had been released and were enrolled into the SSRP program uh, were traumatized. Um, they came to us with issues and challenges and not only had they had the general impacts that we know about for our social de uh, determinants of health, but they also came and they had been traumatized from being in prison or in jail. Um, and most of the individuals we had had been in prison or jail for a long length of time. Uh, so we worked also was important to include a community advisory board and that we got feedback directly from the group that we were working with. So we started that in year one. In addition, we did several focus groups. One of that things was to make sure that we were were providing the services that were intrinsic and really needed by this population. And we created program and policy related strategies. Next slide. So SSRP was a team approach. Um, we had an internal team, which included our evaluation, our manager for the program. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that every person who was enrolled that we walked them through, we made sure that they knew every uh, part of the process of the study. But in addition, we had a peer re-engagement specialist and we had those located at a site outside of AFC. The reason for that was we wanted to make sure that we were able to see them as they walked in for medical services. And so what we did and what was really crucial to us was being able to see that client um, on a monthly basis when they came in for their medical services or their um, mental health services or other services they were receiving at our, one of our network sites. Um, we also uh, used a variety of employment services. Um, we at AFC did not have employment services, so it was vital that we really reached out and we made those connections, made those partnerships. And so the first year was really about us uh, building those partnerships, and we continue to this day. Um, that is one of the things that I think um, could be built out even more in a more substantial way. Uh, we reduced barriers to uptake um, and made sure that individuals were able to um, get in and see their medical services as well as apply for employment and housing through a one developed, um, one time use application so that one application went across all programs and services. And then we assisted in building the provider trust. So we made those connections with individuals so that they were able to have a name when they left. And so it just wasn't a blind referral. You knew that you were going to see Marsha at such and such agency and that she was going to talk to you about a job. Next slide. So the first partnership we did was the National Alliance for the Empowerment of the Formerly Incarcerated. And the point was, this is a program a, uh, that has been working for over 25 years. They do only peer services. So we connected with them to make sure that we had individuals from the reentry population that was working with our population and that they could provide reentry circles, which was a once a week drop-in center where individuals would be able to go for services, as well as they could train the providers and our network that we were working with to make sure that we were all doing culturally and linguistically uh, good services for the reentry population. We also wanted them to be able to provide some coaching and mentoring in a strength-based approach so that they were going to the clients and saying, yes, you can succeed, you can have a job, you can be retained in that uh, position by using some of the skills that you've learned while you've been incarcerated. And we just wanted to reduce isolation so that they had a buddy and somewhere that they could go for services. Next slide. The other um, network that we use was called Solve Is, um, and it just recently changed their name. Uh, so I can send that information, but it's a web-based employment program. Um, and the idea is that we didn't know this previous to COVID-19 that this was going to be so immensely um, 
we started this in late 2019 as I really wanted to build out and make sure that we had more services and a way to sustain the program after it ends so that we were able to connect clients from reentry directly to the navigator who could use a program, help them to build a resume, help them to do their job searching all online. And so this has been something that we've been using and it has been um, quite handy in the fact that we're not seeing clients one-on-one, -on -one, but can now connect with them in a web-based environment as long as they have a smartphone. Next slide. The main thing that we have done with our program was to do really a community approach. I wanted everybody who is a part of the task force, and we have over um, 45 members on our task force that we meet monthly, and it's important for us to pull together and be able to do something organized together so that they um, really had something that was beneficial to them being a part of the task force and spending their time every month. So we decided to do a Summit of Hope, which is modeled at the, after the Illinois Department of Public Health Summits of Hope, and we call it a Women's Connection Summit of Hope. And the idea was that we would meet women because we were starting to see more and more women as a part of our program, as part of reentry, and those numbers are growing. And so we wanted to connect with parole, make sure that they had access to employment and housing, uh, do some community outreach, training and education, um, provide ID services. We also did health screenings and services. And because it was women, we wanted to make it a little bit fun um, for them to come and make it exciting for them. So we provided a woman's closet so that they could get professional wear to wear to job interviews. We had hair and skin services available. We provided toiletries, tote bags, and t-shirts. And we did this all with raffle food and entertainment just to make it a day. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those outcomes. The next slide. So we did two summits in 2019. Uh, we had over 90 individuals um, at the first summit. And at the second one, we had a little bit less with about 80. It turned out to be about 105 degrees that day. Um, but we really had a great turnout. We had over 45 vendors. Uh, two people were hired and got jobs on site. They got connections to health services. We identified four new HIV positive individuals, uh, women who had been released um, and didn't know that they were positive, and we connected them to services on that day. We also identified nine hepatitis C uh, during the summit. And we had really great attendance at our round tables and our workshops to make sure that they were knowledgeable about what services. And we did workshops on things uh, such as um, work readiness and how to do a resume. Next slide. So one of our client stories is that we had a 57-year-old who was enrolled into SSRP right after he was released from jail. Um, he was immediately enrolled also into our intensive corrections case management program. He met with our peer re-engagement specialist and found a job um, by working with them for only a couple of months. Due to COVID-19, he recently became homeless um, uh, and was sleeping on a porch um, of his family's house. I don't know if you all remember, but a lot of people were really um, disengaged with this population due to COVID-19 because they thought they, they were carriers because of the new stories. So we put him into what we call bridge housing. Uh, we utilized hotels to house individuals and he was successfully housed in that bridge program for about four and a half months and just recently moved in on July 1st to his permanent housing as a part of our SSRP program and continued to keep his job in the in, um, food industry. So we're very excited for him. Um, and then just some lessons learned that the task force is really essential, that we had a multi-level, multi-discipline um, attachment to it. We had legal services that we did peer re-engagement specialist with fast and quick linkage to care. 
uh, and that we had employers at the table and that we collected data all along the way uh, with some of our lessons learned. Next slide. So I would like to introduce Nancy Vasquez as our next speaker. Hello everyone, my name is Nancy Vasquez. I am a member of Advocate at University Health System located in San Antonio, Texas, um, also known as Bear County Hospital District. Uh, today I will be addressing barriers to care for undocumented populations. These barriers will be addressed through two case studies I've encountered during the implementation of the SPINS project. As a subsequent result of Texas proximity to the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, South Texas does have a significant influx of undocumented individuals. Next slide. First, I would like to start off by giving you a brief background of our university health system. University health system is South Texas only safety net health system. This means we serve individuals who are low income, vulnerable populations, individuals who are uninsured and underinsured. We are a level one trauma center and university health system is Texas third largest hospital system um, and serves over a 28 county region across South Texas. We have over 900 physicians and residents and over 8,800 employees. We are the first and only health system to earn magnet status from the American Nurses Credentialing Center. Next slide. The mission of our institution is to improve the good health of the community through high quality, compassionate patient care, innovation, education, and discovery. Our vision is to lead, that, lead the way to be one of the nation's most trusted health institutions. This leads to our values, which are that our patient care will be high quality and compassionate above all, attentive, kind, and helpful without exception, and wise in the use of resources. When implementing our SPINS project, we strive to keep these at the heart of our work. Next slide. San Antonio is the seventh largest city in the United States. Bear County, which encompasses San Antonio and the surrounding area, is the fourth most populous county in Texas. We provide to provide some perspective, it is slightly larger than the state of Rhode Island. Of the counties we serve, 94% of the region's people with HIV can be found in the San Antonio metropolitan region. We are a minority majority county, we, where 60% uh, and a half of population is Hispanic. This is significantly higher compared to the state's percentage of 37 and a half and the nation's 16.3%. Next slide. The Ryan White Administration Agency is housed at University Health System. We house parts A, B, D, and F, which is our local SPINS project. We serve the San Antonio's transitional grant area, which is made up of four counties. They are Bear, Comal, Guadalupe, and Wilson County. Together, we have approximately 2.4 million people. Our program partners include the Family Focus AIDS Clinical Treatment Services, clinic, which is our FACS clinic. It is housed in the University Health System, Robert, Robert, B. Green, Robert B. Green campus, sorry. Um, our specialty partners include Black Effort Against the Threat of AIDS, Beat AIDS, San Antonio AIDS Foundation, short for uh, SAFE, Alamo Area Resource Center, ARC, El Centro del Barrio, and also Metro uh, Centro Med. And the newest partner is the Holistic Empowerment Resource, which is specific to the Part D services we offer. All of our service providers are located within Bear County, except for the Holistic Empowerment Resource, which is located in Comal County. We are really fortunate to be able to have services in the Comal County area to prevent clients from traveling to San Antonio for their medical needs. Next slide. Now about our SPINS program. Our SPINS program started in September 2017 and we are coming up on a third year of implementation. This picture is of our Robert B. Green campus where our FACS um, clinic is located and it's located downtown. It also has a new addition um, that's not pictured. This is an older um, 
original uh, campus that you see. So majority of our clients reside in this area of downtown San Antonio. And the office where we meet our clients is located in the first floor of this exact building that you see. Our SPINS project is called CASE, which stands for Care, Housing, and Employment. Our pro project is made up of a project investigator, administrative manager, three member advocates such as myself, a program coordinator, data manager, and data coordinator. CASE program was implemented in racial and ethnic minority communities in the four county San Antonio transitional grant area. CASE was designed to address the region's large number of people with unstable housing situations, high unemployment rates, and low medical care adherence with the goal of increasing viral suppression, suppression rates. The target population is individuals living with HIV who are 18 and over and underemployed or unemployed, homeless or unstably housed. We work closely with our partner agencies to develop innovative strategies to assist these individuals obtaining housing and employment while adhering their medical care. The member advocate's role is to focus on the intervention aspects of the program and while the program coordinator and data coordinator focus on the retention and evaluation activities. Next slide. That's a picture of our team. Our team was new to the HRSA grants and we had to quickly get acclimated to this project in order to meet the project's goals. One of the ways we achieved this through was a diverse group of individuals as member advocates. The talent and experience of our team range from working at a law firm that specializes in social security benefits and an insurance company who focuses on verification and claims. We have other staff who um, have experience working with the state. They also work with CareLink, a financial assistance program offered through the health system. I myself am a licensed realtor and I have assisted clients with numerous difficult housing situations. As you see, we all have unique skill sets and further our progress to goals. Our team has a strong desire to assist the clients and we consistently review the resources available to our clients. Next slide. The first sample case will be the Maria case. I have omitted any identifiers to follow HIPAA guidelines and to protect clients' privacy. In February 2019, a Honduran immigrant woman was enrolled. She was assigned to me being that I am the only fluent Spanish speaking member advocate on the team, and she was also facing foreclosure. Maria had recently widowed. Her husband had passed away from AIDS related illness. Maria was undocumented and was not on the mortgage note. The husband had not been able to work months before the passing, resulting in the mortgage to fall behind several months. She was now the head of household and never having formal employment experience before. If that wasn't hard enough, client also had American born twin girls with HIV, living with HIV. Maria had breastfed the girls without knowing she, had, she was HIV positive, causing her to transmit HIV to the girls. Next slide. This was a multi-level needs client. I'm sure you all can relate when I say I didn't even know where to start. Ever to stop foreclosure uh, were made. We hoped HOPA could help uh, keep her in her home, but strict HOPA guidelines do not allow back payments, payoffs, nor offer financial assistance to someone who is not on the mortgage note. We tried selling the property, but liens on the property made it difficult to do so. No buyer or investor wanted to fall responsible for the debt of the property. Her husband had always been the breadwinner. As tears fell from her eyes, she explained how she missed her husband. She had to now find a way to provide for her twin girls and two boys. With no family support, client leaned on a friend who she, she had made in the past year. Her friend had brought her to the enrollment and intake appointment and continued to help her every time my client asked her. Next slide. After hearing my client, I tried to give her as much as I could. My goal was to empower her every chance I could get. I continued her, I connected her to legal aid and specialize, in specializing in immigration processes and humanitarian visas. I called her often to offer guidance on real estate spe specifically for the foreclosure situation happening. Life coaching, helping her 
prioritize the importance um, in appointments and often reminding her the legal documents she needed to take with her to um, make the appointment successful. Medicaid, CareLink, food stamps, just a, food, just a few of the assistance programs we navigated through together. I also took opportunity, I also took every opportunity to stress the importance to keeping up with her medical appointments. I spoke frequently to her medical case manager at our partner agency to ensure client accesses all supportive services available to her and her family. Bus passes, grocery gift cards, uh, HAPWA, client gained momentum. She showed up to appointments on time. She always had a great attitude. I wanted to make sure a client can build on her present skills. As I got to know her, I noticed she was always um, able to prepare hot meals for her kids every day, every single meal. I noticed she cooked with great ease. Even though she was hungry, she even prepared great Mexican dishes. Next slide. We recognize the client's joy for cooking. The picture of this is a tamales. My client now sells her tamales. Tamales is job security in South Texas. Everyone loves tamales. Maria began to offer tamales to neighbors and friends of friends. We, end, we then magnified her entrepreneurial spirit by helping her promote her food as catering business to local businesses. The local businesses soon made her, sta made her food staple at their establishments and requested lunch and dinner catering services. This now allowed Maria to earn three times more than she ever made selling her, to her friends and neighbors. I'm very proud of her. She is now, she's very hardworking and she has now been housed since um, March of 2019. Um, next slide. Uh, tips to listen carefully um, with what strengths clients already possess. Capitalize on what you ha they have experience in, what they love to do, such as ability to cook, natural customer experience, spirit, um, peer support, or just a few I have often seen. Lastly, provide feedback, but understand that clients will make the best decisions for themselves. We can only guide them, and they will ultimately do what's best for them. Next slide. I have a second case, which is the Miguel case. Miguel immigrated from Mexico more than 25 years ago. Miguel was enrolled onto SPINS June of 2019. Client spoke perfect English and Spanish during his, during his uh, first intake uh, visit. Client shared that he was a professional back in Mexico. He worked as an accountant. I listened to him and remember asking, um, I remember asking him uh, what had him living here alone on the streets if he had a professional career back home. He shared that his family had disowned him and didn't want to speak to him ever again. Miguel, Miguel had no difficulty landing cash jobs. He often worked as a cook in mom and pop restaurants here in San Antonio. He, his last job was different. It was a small car dealership, like a car lot. And a week in, Miguel was tasked to go fill in the gas tank um, on one of the new used cars at the lot. The client headed to the nearest gas station, but unfortunately, the client was pulled over by the police. The car did not have proper license plates or registration. Miguel was arrested and the arrest resulted in deportation back to Mexico. Next slide. Klein had been undocumented for over 25 years, but he had never been able to start the immigration process, much less ask for a green card. He was homeless for the majority of the time he had lost his dad, wife, and kids due to his alcohol and substance disease. Miguel often expressed having bad luck in life, but the lack of car registration knowledge and requirements had placed him in a very vulnerable position that day. Next slide. Before the incident that led to his deportation, the strategies I followed with client was to motivate client by finding him rental properties, op rental property options I um, owned by and owned and managed by private landlords. Miguel liked a few of them and I, him, him and I discussed a plan to meet his housing goal, saving up as much as possible from his cash jobs in order to secure one of the rental properties soon as they never stay available for long. 
we spoke about applying for a humanitarian visa and using the same legal aid resource as previous case. Next slide. Miguel's ability to keep working helped him so many ways, so many years. His education, the well-spoken English, and his strong ability to move forward helped him survive with his barriers to care this entire time, 25 years. Next slide. Providing tips for this, um, I would recommend providing as many resources as possible as some resources might not be an option anymore. Being undocumented restricts many from access, assessing, um, accessing, sorry, assistance that is only offered to U.S. residents, such as living at uh, most apartment complexes, public housing, and any landlord who requires credit scores. Communicating with clients often um, is also good, as most change their phone numbers fast or don't even have a phone, period. Understanding that client's history to make sure that the right resource, resources are accessed. Sometimes being 25 years a documenter plus, they do tend to um, burn some bridges um, at some agencies. Reducing as many barriers to their care and ensuring their safety as much as possible. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you. Serena, back to you. Thanks, Nancy. And Cynthia and Joe, wow, that was um, really great. Uh, the fabulous examples um, from what you're all doing in your agencies. And um, before we go on to the live discussion, I just want to um, maybe go around our panel and um, just ask some specific advice from you about working with your pop with the, the specific population that your, your agencies chose to work with. Um, Nancy, I'm going to start with you. I know you just spoke, but can I start with you if you want to come back on? Um, and given your experience as a realtor, you talked a lot about tips that you share with clients in terms of getting housing and finding employment and how you tap into their resources. What advice do you have um, for other Ryan White programs who may be working with this population? What, what tips do you have for like talking with providers about your clients or housing or employment? What sort of tips do you share that way? Any advice there? Hello, yes. So I typically get to see where the clients are comfortable um, accessing uh, assistance, assistance at our partner agencies or even the part of town they're in, uh, comfortable uh, residing in. Uh, based on that, typically you, can, you can't really uh, call up a, an employer or a hiring manager and tell them, do you hire people without social security numbers or something like that? So it's a lot of uh, building relationships, a lot of face-to-face, -face, um, even just warm leads, like um, knowing that somebody already works there. Um, so I typically try to um, get a sense of what the client is comfortable with and then start digging after that um, and then trying to get everybody else um, that's staff here on board and like pretty much communicating. We all find different uh, resources for my, for our clients that way. Great. Thanks so much. Um, Joe, I'm going to go over to you next. You, you talked about the importance of really needing to integrate local, federal, state policies um, to, to sort of support and empower um, transgender populations. What tips or advice would you have for other Ryan White organizations on how you go about integrating those policies? Something from your experience, like what, what advice do you have for them to do? You really have to work with in the strength based of your communities. There is a lot of grassroots information where they're pulling census information. Um, uh, so it, you have to really do a community scan. I know in San Francisco, there's a lot of community advocates they had to develop the resources. So really find your trans uh, folks resources and start partnering with them, start sharing them, start building language. One of the biggest things with all these partners, is we didn't share the same uh, language. We also didn't share the same view or, or, or what we thought was a successful outcome. And so um, the nice thing is, is there's a lot of social equity 
uh, in the, the trans community. And there's a lot of trans law centers throughout uh, in a, multiple states to really protect individuals access to employment and restroom access. So you can really re leverage them uh, because they've been doing a lot of this work on their own without having the full breadth of services. So I'd really look to them and then also community centers that specialize it. But there's a lot of small mom and pop uh, um, trans centers and community services. And so you really um, you can find them in a lot of interesting, a lot of one people nonprofits are out there. And those are the ones that we really uh, want to partner with. They're doing the hard work and uh, reaching folks that are hardest to reach. Great, thanks so much. And Cynthia, I just love this idea of these summits for hope for women and the, 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 what you've been organizing. So if, if I wanted to do that in my area, what advice do you have for me? Like what are some tips in terms of getting these summits organized? I would say the first thing is to really have a network, a group of individuals who really want to do that type of work. You know, we've all done health fairs, but this is entirely different in that they have to be invested, they have to be able to come to the table with services, be able to provide them the day of. It's all done very fast. It's a lot of organizing to have it put together. So I would say starting with your community partnerships and making sure that the network wants to be a part of it. I also um, think that one of the things that is really crucial is working with parole and probation or whoever um, is a part of that population. And since this is for reentry, they are going to be integral partners. And then the other thing that we did was um, sustaining it and trying to raise funds for it. It's important to have, um, we worked with CDPH and IDPH, making sure that we had support. Great, thanks, great model. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm gonna um, just share all this information. You have a great panel experts here who can help give you advice of what to do in your own local area. And, and um, in, in terms of implementing and reaching these vulnerable populations. Um, so here's all our contact information for you. Uh, you'll also on uh, HRSA's Target HIV Center, um, you'll find more information about our housing and employment project and um, some resources there. Uh, coming soon in the next few months, keep checking that out. Each one of these sites are doing an implementation manual so you can learn that nitty gritty about how to do some of these models that they talked about today. And I want to just call your attention to some upcoming workshops about um, that continue this um, discussion around housing and employment. Uh, we have one on Wednesday, August 12th at 2.30, where um, people will be sharing other systems models and addressing those structural barriers um, for people experiencing homelessness. Um, on Thursday at 2.30 to 4, um, we have the third of the series about leveraging multi-sectoral partnerships to increasing housing and employment. And following that at 4.30, we have some specific, uh, a one workshop with two of our sites specifically talking about how to use your HUD dollars um, to, to, and leverage those dollars to help get people housed. So with that, I want to um, turn it over back to our moderator and um, project officer, Carlos Heath. Thank you, Serena. And thank um, Joe, um, Cynthia, as well as Nancy for a wonderful presentation, as well as that um, um, robust discussion and, and information that you have given us in terms of the Housing and Employment Initiative. Um, the great work that you have done over the past three years, and I have thoroughly enjoyed being your project officer um, for this initiative. Um, this is just some information on how to claim your continuing education credit. So if you would like to receive um, continuing education credits for this activity, please um, click on the, the, the link here. Next slide. And once again, thank you from the HIV Housing and Employment Project. And this is session one of three of this um, series and we, um, as Serena said, we um, invite you to join us for the other two sessions. We will now um, open it up for discussion. <laughs>